can you tell me how did you become interested in gerontology? Oh, it was just happenstance because uh, I was a member of the United States Public Health Service mm -hmm. Commission Corps and the, the chief nurse of the Public Health Service said, we're, we're going into long-term care. And I said, I don't know a thing about it. I was in rehabilitation, I studied and at the master's level, but she, oh, she said, uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll learn together. And I thought, mm -mm, I need to do more than that. I, I didn't tell her, but at that point I knew I needed to start studying it formally. I just felt the need to, to get, um, oh, and I don't know if I've won another degree or not, but I knew I needed a, at least a, a certificate in gerontology. So then can you describe then, since you've mentioned that, your career trajectory as a gerontologist? Oh, I, I really didn't plan it at all. I, uh, I didn't know you're supposed to plan, plan it. In fact, I didn't think of it as a, as a very uh, long thing. I thought, okay, I'll, I'll see what this, this job is going to be, which is uh, to be part of the, it was the Office of Nursing Home Affairs at that time, because President Nixon had promised uh, before his election that he, I don't know if you heard it, at the, and that, he, had, he stepped out in Nashua, New, uh, New Hampshire, and he said, uh, I'm going, going to improve the nursing homes mm -hmm. of this nation, something like that. You know. And I didn't think anything of it at all. But he was carrying through his promise, and that's why he created the Office of Nursing Home Affairs, which later became, it, it was renamed Office of Long-Term Care. Okay. And so did you start off with the certificate and continue on? Oh. No, I did two things together. Okay. Uh, since I uh, could use the GI Bill, I could get another baccalaureate, it's called BIS, mm -hmm. uh, back Bachelor of Independent Studies, uh, since they didn't have a master's yet. Uh, this is at George Mason University. Mm -hmm. And you could also earn a certificate in gerontology. So I did the two together. Mas is a uh, majored in public health and then dwelled in gerontology. It was a perfect mix because I could take whatever I wanted, both undergraduate and graduate courses. And it sounds like it was a good compliment. Yeah, but it, it was the job that, that was so engrossing. So at what point yeah. do you think in your career did you embrace this um, term gerontologist to describe yourself? Oh, I don't know. I don't think it, it, I don't think I realized it until I, I was a, a couple assignments later. I was ordered to uh, Fort Worth and I wasn't very keen about it and I thought, it says the, the Federal Bureau of Prisons to be the director of nursing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, here I go again. I don't, know a th I don't know a thing about prisons. What am I going to do? And it doesn't sound very appealing to me to go there. But uh, the medical director wrote again. And he said, I notice you're you haven't answered me <laughs> about going. So I said, oh, uh, I'll, I'll go if, um, I, I, maybe the, the um, chief nurse of the Bureau of Prisons would go with me and then we'd visit together and it'd give me a chance to ask her questions and, and get acquainted with what's there. Mm -hmm. So, but I, uh, then I asked him, you know, why, why pick me? And he said, you've got gerontology 
and nursing administration and the computer kept going back to your name. So that's how we found you. So I thought, uh-oh, there's, there's a gerontology. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, you know, that I don't think there's a, I can question that, you know. So that validated you as a gerontologist? Yeah, I, I thought about it then more, more formally. Okay. Now, did you have uh, female mentors who might have impacted your move into gerontology? Mm. I, I don't think uh, I uh, thought about them in, anybody uh, as a as a gerontologist. Oh, uh, uh, I just kind of felt my way around and kept searching for uh, mentors that could could disinspire me, not necessarily in gerontology, but uh, it, they really inspired me more about leadership and the, the possibilities I might have. I never thought about being at the top of anything. Oh. So can you talk about who oh. those mentors might have been and how you went about finding them maybe? Well, when, uh, because I was um, in, uh, an associate editor of the American Journal of Nursing, I got to meet a, a lot of the very uh, impressive people, our leaders in nursing, but also authors and the great leaders. So I admired people like uh, Eleanor Lambertson, who talked about teen nursing. Mm -hmm. And then when she became the, uh, the head of the, of the department where I was studying for my doctorate at, at Teachers College, College University, mm -hmm. that she became my mentor. Uh, she took me on as, as her person to guide uh, for my for the project for the doctoral project, mm -hmm. partly because they, they were, the the faculty was very hesitant about it. They just thought she wants to do a clinical study, mm -hmm. and most of the students do do something in curriculum because my major was teaching curriculum. Yeah. Then so. She stood up and said, uh, you'll have to you know, change, change your major. Mm -hmm. And the faculty said, yes, she ought to do that and take 12 more credits. And she stood up and said, how many credits do you want her to take? Mm -hmm. She's, she already has, she, she numbered them off, you know, more than she needs now. So, so if she takes the certification exam, in curriculum and teaching, mm -hmm. and she passes, and and this is uh, I, I've already I've already was a doctor student, but here's the change in major thing. Mm -hmm. That if she passes, then you'll have to accept her, and she could take uh, cybernetics and mathematics, the two for sure. Mm -hmm which will go along with her way of thinking, which is systems thinking. So it was more being the person who was open to ideas and, and didn't say, well, we, nobody's done that before. You know? Nobody's used television before. Oh. What, uh, TV's hardly here yet. You know? Who's got television installed that she could do it? So the, the faculty is very uh, doubtful that it was possible to do this project that I was dreaming up. Mm -hmm. so that, but whether there was gerontology in it, no, that wasn't my thought at all. 
it didn't matter what age the uh, patients were going to be, I was going to try to include all of them. And so do you think you used this idea of working with someone who was open to ideas mm -hmm. to continue to pick mentors or to find mentors? Did that help you lead how you might have found other mentors? It was, the, the next was accidental too. I, I wasn't searching for a mentor, okay. but when I was uh, searching for funds, everybody has a struggle for fun. Uh, for the project, they, there were two people in the United States Public Health Service who uh, became my mentors because they really believed in me. They, they just thought, well, you, do you know you, you, you're going to be able to measure the quality of care? Mm -hmm. I said, really? <laughs> I didn't know that. And they said, yes, and we'll, we'll, we'll help, help fund you to, to make it possible. So with your kind of system thinking, you could either go to Johns Hopkins or Ohio State. They're the two places where they do that kind of thinking. You're, you, are, you are in cybernetics and the systems approach to nursing. That there's, so they guided me that way and became my mentors for three years and who were that way. So that was uh, Elwyn Vreeland, who's now in the Hall of Fame, uh, Nursing Hall of Fame and ANA, and Florence Reynolds. Uh, she, she wasn't a nurse, just a, a brilliant creative person who was on the staff of the Division of Nursing of the, of the United States Public Health Service at that time. The, the other two mentors I, I found when, when I was assigned to, to teach at Fort Sam Houston, when a part of the Army Nurse Corps, I didn't tell you, I, I, I joined the Army Nurse Corps Reserves to help pay for my master's. Okay. And when was that? So uh, that was uh, 54. Okay. I uh, signed up and, and went to Case Western Reserve for my master's, because mm -hmm. I couldn't afford anything uh, that, uh, that high. And to me, that was the best in the country, so I went there at that mm -hmm. time. And my, uh, my second assignment, my first assignment was in Denver, but the second one, as uh, I, went, I was assigned to teach at Fort Sam Houston at the uh, medical training center. And the chief of that center was Catherine, K Catherine Ball, Colonel Catherine Ball, and Major Helen Halo. And the two of them also informal mentors. I didn't call them that at all, but they, they just believed in me and they, they loved the way I had this, all this imagination. So, but they, they would always ask us, if, if you have any ideas, <laughs> that's dangerous when you do that to me, if you have any ideas to improve our classes, uh, let us know. So of course, you know, mm -hmm. I thought I had, I, I did one on the enema, excuse me for the subject, but mm -hmm. anyway, the, uh, and uh, I knew what was missing in, in the way they were teaching the enema mm -hmm. and uh, suggested a, a couple of ways of audiovisuals and so on. Mm -hmm. And it was also, I was inspired by that kind of teaching that they were doing there because we were preparing, it was still the Korean War was winding down, but we were still preparing a lot of medics at that time. And if you can imagine teaching about 2,500 a week, uh, it was this great team, many, many teams together, that we had to be very efficient and effective. And they all passed. The six week we at the sixth week, we would test them for everything we had taught them and they all would pass, you know, and I thought, we really have a wonderful way of, of looking at a model if we did, uh, because nursing could do just as well or even better with, with this kind of teaching. So that's off the subject, but. Very impressive, though. <laughs> so what is unique, you think, about being a woman geontologist? Oh, I, uh, having been with so many men in the service, especially, that it's always fun to surprise them because they don't ever expect 
uh, you know, anything unusual from us. So, and, and that, that's, that just, that, that leads me to the, my last assignment was back to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Okay. okay. So, they said, oh, don't worry. You know, I got there, there, there was no nursing staff. Well, there was one, but she left the day I, I came. Um, didn't say a word, but just disappeared. Uh, so there I was, director of nursing and no staff. So they said, oh, don't worry. We're, we're going to build a new facility for long-term care, and that's why you're here. I said, oh, okay. And so the architect came by and he said, uh, you have any ideas? I said, yes, I'll bring you a picture. So he said, oh, all right. So I brought it to him and uh, I wanted an atrium because I wanted sunshine. I wanted everyone to be cheerful in, mm -hmm. in this long-term care facility. So I said, I, I like this room, uh, multi uh, since I know the, having been uh, in the federal service, I knew all these regulations, having been the, the, the chief of, mm -hmm. of quality assurance okay. in Baltimore. So I did know quite a bit about the uh, rules. So I knew what needed to be built mm -hmm. in, the, um, in a multi-facet uh, facility, room especially, mm -hmm. uh, would be necessary. So I said, and I like everything movable, the greens and pots, the, all the furniture mm -hmm. in this room, and uh, it would go like that. And the, the, the warden said, I had no idea you had such, that uh, you would think of this. He just said, I figured you know, you'd, we'd have three stacks of cells, you know, yeah. and they'd be for long-term care. Okay. I said, no, we, we need um, an ICU, Mm -hmm. And everything should be removable, and we've got these um, these companies that can provide that equipment that we can take out immediately, so there's no danger of, of leaving any uh, equipment in the room where we don't need it. And then there's we'll have uh, a, an isolation um, security. It's almost a cell, but it's a uh -huh. security room with the, all the necessary. Uh, reverse uh, environment to protect the the uh, staff and patients and 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 so it went on mm -hmm. and we were able to put in the most up to date equipment because uh, we'd get the staff to to think about what they'd like uh, ideal mm -hmm. and also I said we need to be saving energy for everybody so I'd like this nursing. Central nursing station and measure the feet so mm -hmm. nobody's going to exert themselves at great distances. So it was a um, spoke, wheel and spoke kind of yeah. shape. Um, it, it was things like that. So it's, it's just, the, uh, I, I don't know why, but mm -hmm. men don't always expect you to produce all this. Uh, Sounds mm -hmm. like your trajectory, your career trajectory, and your knowledge in the various areas of nursing and gerontology really fused together well. Yeah, I think so. It, uh, it, it came together uh, when I didn't expect, mm -hmm. expect a job to uh, be an opportunity like that. Yeah. So when they, they, um, they said, you know, we also, the, the, the chaplain said, we'd like to also think about their religious and spiritual needs. I said, oh yes, definitely. So we, he said, well, how about we have a committee to think about hospice? Mm -hmm. I said, okay. You know. So we, we, we kept meeting and it took us over a year to come out with what we would really like for, for our hospice. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, let, let's send our youngest chaplain, he happened to be the Catholic chaplain, on up to Springfield, Missouri, mm -hmm. where they have the very first program going mm -hmm. for hospice care. So we did that, and he brought back their manual too. 
So we uh, revised their manual and began teaching and offering an opportunity for the inmates to volunteer. And, and we got so many volunteers, we said, we're just amazed that that many would care. And they came and got training and then the, and I'd walk by one that would be on duty and he'd, he'd stand right up and said, oh, he said, I just want to thank you for picking me. I said, oh, I didn't select you. I didn't want to tell him that, that there, there was, a, to me, a much greater power going on here, yeah. not just me doing this. But anyway, it, it would be that way in that the, both the patients and the, the, the inmate companions were, were just clicking away. Mm -hmm. And I said, and what's your specialty? I asked the companion, and he said, oh, I, I read the Bible. And that, you know, each one would say, would ask anything special. Mm -hmm. Be asked if they wanted anything, and one would say, "Oh, I'd like to like to hear the Bible," mm -hmm. or no one said, "I'd like someone to pray with me or pray for me," and, and no one would tell me then. He says, "I'm a specialist in prayer. I, I like I like to pray," and that kind of thing. And it be, it would just go that way. Is mm -hmm. it uh, it just would snowball in, in that to be enthusiasm and Oh, uh, everybody got satisfied. Okay. Despite the, the the rest of the facility is a it's a World War II facility, so it it's re it was really old. Uh -huh. And when I got there, I said, "Oh, we really need to scrub this down." So that that's what we did at the very beginning is not just get acquainted with the setting, but to get it in shape so we could be proud of it. And the and then at the end. The, the greatest satisfaction we got was to meet with all the other tops mm -hmm. of the, the various prison uh, medical, medical facilities, and we were told that we had to be accredited. We said, oh, <laughs> one, more, one more challenge. And the other, the other director's nursing said, poor Fort Worth, never make it. Yeah, we'll show them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you were used to that. <laughs> now, has being a gerontologist yeah. interacted with your own personal aging process? Oh, my own personal. Oh, I think so. Because af uh, after we got the, the accreditation uh, fully accredited as a long-term care facility, then I retired after after that in 95. So I said, oh, what I, I really should find another specialty mm -hmm. because what I love is th thinking about the, not only the spiritual aspects, but all the whole patient. And that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the, the lines I have in my cardiosurgical cardio book is the importance of the whole patient. Mm -hmm. So the so it meant to me the aging process uh, is not important except to keep growing. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said okay. I'll, I started studying, and it took four years uh, to become a holistic nurse. Okay. Yeah, cert become and then become certified for that. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing that. Uh, I was offered a job to uh, my, like I said, my encore job, I guess, uh, at the National Council on Aging. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm still yeah. busy with them, is uh, I was offered an opportunity to be director of the National Interfaith Coalition on Aging, mm -hmm. which you probably know, it uh, focuses on spirituality and spiritual well-being. And in doing so, I, it was one of the things I'm very interested in anyway, mm -hmm. and, and a chance to continue the, the leadership opportunities of leading uh, all the different denominations and religions mm -hmm. in uh, looking after the needs, the spiritual needs of the aging. It's really no matter what age. Right, right. So that holism probably applies to your own aging process very much so as well. Yes, it's. Uh, 
I'm, I'm very uh, focused on trying to remain spiritual. Good. <laughs> now the Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. Within that framework, is there anything else you would like us to know? You mean about my, leg my legacy? Sure, our legacy of women in gerontology. Well, I think, uh, <coughs> I think back on the, um, right after we were uh, selected uh, to head up the, the Office of Nursing Home Affairs at that time, we, we gathered, and I, I mentioned, already mentioned uh, Florence Reynolds. Mm -hmm. So she, we gathered with her uh, and just the, small, the smallest top staff, and we did the brainstorming. And that's when this unusual legacy started, mm -hmm. which was to have the very first unannounced visit of nursing homes in the nation. And in, in doing that, we surprised them with a national, a perfect, to me it was a perfect national sample because it got the Center for, National Center for Health Statistics to figure out our sample for us mm -hmm. so nobody could question it. That was our first, mm -hmm. we said okay. So because we knew the nursing home owners would not be pleased with what we were going to do. Right. And we would then ask all 10 directors of the region to decide how they would like to do their rounds. So nobody else would know where they were coming from or where they're going and so on. And then to call, they said, oh, let's ask for volunteers. So we call for volunteers around the nation mm -hmm. and they all came from, from, uh, that were on federal rolls and already cleared, of course. So we got 15 teams together of eight persons, each, each with a specialty, you know, administrator, physician, uh -huh. yeah record specialists, pharmacists and nurse and social worker and so on. And they, they did, without telling their families, they did the rounds of surveying. After they had finished a week with us, we had, pre of course, we had created a, a training book uh, for them to take home. And we gathered out here at Reston in, in secret, we thought. And uh, they, they did the training and then went off immediately, packed up, and reported to the various regions. And that's how the, the very first patient-centered um, surveys were created, and the use of research tools to do so. That up to that time, it was always, you have the potential of being um, a, a good nursing home. Mm -hmm. And so that was, a, that was the first in terms of being, uh, asking the patients what they thought and um, looking at them and, and evaluating and getting your first evidence-based information. And, uh, and when uh, Faye Abdella would, would tell about the results of our study, which we, we finished, of course, we finished the the whole thing mm -hmm. by October, and they handed me all this to put together um, the report, right. which is okay with me because <laughs> having done that for five years at American Journal of Nursing, it was fun to do. Okay. So we, we put it together in November, we had the report ready for the president and, and also other media. So there would be a slide tape kind of media uh, nobody could misinterpret what we, what we had found, uh, that, that kind of thing. And every region got a copy of uh, the media to use mm -hmm. and, and so on. So it's, you could see why it was nice to have Florence Reynolds there since she was a specialist in uh, media and uh, such things, uh, public relations. Oh. But that, they were all, that was all women, that's how I started. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> you said you know, all women okay. and uh, brainstorming together. And that's how things happen. 
that's a very, I think, exciting legacy for someone like me to hear that because that's still happening today. Oh, the, the yes, the, the struggle of nursing homes trying to uh, meet those, those the standards we kept revising and <laughs> proving.